Welcome to the Tribe of Testimonies. Here you will find conversations with faithful Native American members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, sharing their stories and their love of the Savior. My name's Andrea Hales. I'm Navajo, and I'm glad that you've decided to come and join us today. My guest today is Eileen Crocker. When I first um, found all of her information on social media, it didn't have Crocker as the last name, so I had to make sure I had the right name. Um, but apparently she has quite a following on TikTok. I think she mentions that during this interview. So um, she's doing the best she can in her life to show people how living the gospel of Jesus Christ can make one happy. I, I think she is so happy. In fact, every time I see any of her her social media, I'm just like, she is she's got to be a joy to be around. And I really enjoyed our conversation and I hope you do too. So here is Eileen. I'm on the phone today with Eileen Crocker and we've already had some giggles this morning as we've prepared um, some talking points for ourselves. So it's been really nice. Um, Eileen, would you please introduce yourself in your tribal way as much as possible? If it's in your language, great. If it's not, that's fine. Not everybody speaks their language, and some languages are dead. Okay, Dalgadasi. Eileen Crocker on the ISA, the Kaya Bashti. She taught Ernie Crocker net, that she mod, and the TSA Crocker net. So, was the Dionysus, the Sakai, the Anandesi. Good morning, greetings. My name is Eileen Crocker. I am of the Mesquite People Clan, born for the um, I'm sorry, born for the Mexican people clan. And I am the happy and proud daughter of Ernie and Jenna Crocker, both are beyond the veil. And I live in White River and I am full-blooded White Mountain Apache. Yeah, that's awesome. So um, <clears throat> I've been following Eileen for a while on, on social media um, and we've, we've never really talked until a few nights ago. So that was kind of fun to, to talk, even though I knew a lot about her already. So... <laughs> Um, I share a lot. <laughs> um, Eileen, would you please share something that you love about your heritage? Uh, it could be a story, a celebration, a way of life, a ceremony, anything that you love about your heritage, especially as it relates to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I sure would. I am so, so happy to have met you. You know, at first meeting, the vibe is awesome. I love it. And I am so proud to of my heritage. I am White Mountain Apache. And one thing that I really thought about when um, we talked about doing this is to share how beautiful our indigenous cultures uh, revere our matrilineal society. We go from our mothers. Our clans are from our mothers. And we, um, we really honor our mom. And I know that in the church that we honor and keep our Mother Eve so sacred. So for me, in reference to my culture, um, a few years ago, well, gosh, it's been a while, um, I was asked to be a godmother to a beautiful girl and since then have become a godmother to five other girls. And this was right after my own daughter, Makanalani, had her sunrise dance ceremony, a traditional Apache puberty ceremony. So after we completed hers, I was asked to do the same for another girl and more after that. But it is the most difficult thing to entrust your daughter with another. Um, in choosing my, God, my godparents for my oldest daughter, I really had to think about who would um, direct her and be there for her as if I wouldn't be there. And I really think, I really believe we chose awesome godparents for my daughter. And to this day, she's still very close with them. She had her dance in 2012. But um, in reference to what I feel is so beautiful about our culture is that because I entrusted another woman to be a godmother to my daughter, five others, six others have actually chose me. So I became a godmother to a beautiful young lady. Her name was Amanda, and she was only a little, I think, 11-year-old. And we did her entire uh, sunrise dance, uh, traditional Apache sunrise dance. Lots of dancing, lots of cooking, lots of 
um, preparing. And the part that I want to touch on is the traditional massage. And when you do the massage, you are massaging her from the top of her head to the tip of her toes. And it is, in, in my experience, doing it for these girls, I was exhausted. Um, they sing the Apache songs while you first you do with your hands. Um, you pull her hair, you um, tap her mouth so that she'd always speak good words, and you massage her arms and legs, and everything would be strong. But in the process of all that, I prayed and prayed and prayed that everything that she would need, she would receive. I prayed that she would be strong and she would be um, not have to deal with the hardships of the world, but if she did, she would be strong. And I remember after, well, you do it with your hands first, and then you next you do it with your feet, and it's through her entire body. And it's it's the most um, special part that I feel that I've been able to take part in, because I noticed that after I was just exhausted, and everything I am, everything that I have been blessed with, I did my best to put these gifts and blessings to this to these girls. And I have amazing goddaughters. I have Amanda, my first goddaughter. She is a senior at Northern Arizona University. She's a Gates Millennium Millennial Millennium Scholar. <laughs> and then um, my goddaughters after her are just as successful. I have one goddaughter who works and has her own car. She's so successful. Another goddaughter who's in college. Another goddaughter, goddaughter who plays college basketball. Um, these girls have really blessed my life. And I think about that moment when I massaged them. And I don't, I, I, I know the blessings that I've been given and the talents and gifts that I have. And I put everything I had into these girls with that massage. And it's just the most special thing that I believe that our culture is able to instill for us to give to these girls. And these girls are mine for the rest of their lives. And I always tell them that. I'm like, you belong to me. <laughs> They're just my daughters, just like all my other daughters. And I love that about our culture. And I have um, Amanda, Tila, Nalani, um, Patricia, Kimora, and Sonia. And so those are all my beautiful goddaughters. That the little one, I got her when she was just a little girl. I think she's a little elementary fifth grader now, but I got her when she was a baby. But the others, I've massaged all of them. So that's one thing that I feel was such a such a blessing in my culture that I could use through prayer and just hoping for the best for her. Because I know as moms, we do that for our girls, for our daughters and sons. So that's something that I really love about our culture. Yeah. You, you, um, as you've got this intimate relationship with them and they have this trust with you that you just can't replicate in a, any other way. Yes. And I, I keep them close as much as possible. Every time I go to the temple, I put every single one of their names in the temple. They're all over, all over now. So they're all, some of them are grown up, they're out of high school. And um, I have one goddaughter that's still a senior this year. So she's just as beautiful and successful. So I'm proud of all of them. That's awesome. That's so great. And and like you said, the, the their parents are the ones that chose you as well, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. And it. it <laughs> when, when I have one goddaughter that um, we did, she was the, the third dance that we did. And she did a, what we, we call a contract dance. It wasn't the full dance. It was just the the ceremony, the massage ceremony that Saturday in the dressing. She didn't do the crown dance or the other parts of the dance. But she, um, I remember her family, <laughs> she has an amazing family. And one of the uncles said, yeah, we are, we, I've always wanted you to be her godmother since she was a little. And we wanted to make sure that her godmother taught Zumba. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I, I love the conversations of how they came up with um, asking me and my then husband to be their godparents because the stories are all different on why they chose us. And it was, it's special. It's special to know that they trusted us enough, trusted me enough to be, to be a part of their lives. Yeah. Um, so you, you've mentioned a few things that I'd love to talk about. You said you have your own children and you said your former husband. So, um, and you've also shared a lot of that on social media. So I, if it's 
comfortable enough to, for you to share, would you share some of your life story in those regards, like your family? Yes, I would love to. And it's, it's something that I, I do share, like I said, I share a lot about who I am. Um, I'm the youngest daughter and um, my my parents, I really looked up to them because they celebrated their 50th anniversary. They, I, I just looked up to them and I got married when I was 25, no, 23, and I was married for 22 years. And so a quarter of a century of my life I spent with a, a man, and we did were able to go to the Salt Lake Temple and be sealed. But as life happens, um, the marriage did not work out. And through that marriage, I have to say that I am blessed beyond any explanation. I have a beautiful 22-year-old daughter who served a mission uh, a year, year and a half ago. I have a 16-year-old son who... Um, blesses the sacrament and um, does um, temple baptisms. I have a 14-year-old daughter who's in choir, so beautiful. She serves as a representative of one of the communities in our tribe at Mississippi Apache. Then I have a little four-year-old, and she is just the light in our life. And I, I believe she came for a reason. Um, I was pregnant when we went to the temple, and so she's four now. And we got divorced when she was two. And every day I spend with her, I I understand Heavenly Father's plan of how he wants us to continue to be happy. And if she didn't come along, I wonder if the if it would have been difficult because um I was buried for a long time and to be suddenly divorced and to be alone with my kids, I I am so grateful that I have my little four year old that continues to bring light into our family and all my kids are so amazing. They have different personalities, and I, I'm just grateful that the marriage, though it's over, I am still blessed with four amazing kids and six beautiful goddaughters. But I was, I, I, to talk about my divorce, um, it was like I said after my last baby was born, and I was 43, and you know I, I googled <laughs> women who had babies over 40, and I was just like. What's okay, Heavenly Father? What's the plan? <laughs> why, why am I having a baby so late in life? And I didn't realize that she, she would be the one to save me because I, I did not expect or want my marriage to end, but um, circumstances and life and choices and things that happened in the world, I really turned to revelation. You know, I, I am good friends with amazing church members and. One of my friends told me, you know, Eileen, you have the power of revelation. If you need to go do this, you need to ask Heavenly Father. And I, to this day, I look back and I use that story with my kids in any situation that they're going through. I say, you have the power of revelation. So one day I prayed, you know, Heavenly Father, is this the direction I need to go? Please give me a sign that I need to go on with this divorce. And my marriage wasn't perfect. We did have um, our ups and downs. But the good outweighed the bad, I have to say that. And <clears throat> I said that prayer with not knowing what Heavenly Father's plan would be for me. And within the next few days, I had songs that were coming up that I've never heard. On, Sir on, on Sirius Radio, I would hear a song, and the words were just like, oh, my gosh, I, I never thought of this. And then um, just different experiences I was having and revelation of different people who knew things that I didn't know. And so I just decided, and I said, you know, my Heavenly Father wants me to be happy. And so I went through it. I did the paperwork. I paid for it. He was very – he he couldn't um, deny or contest he said, what it, if this is what you want, then we'll do it. And we did the whole process. We went through the whole divorce. And I remember um, it was like it's the tribal, within the tribe to get divorced, everything favors the mother. And if I wasn't who I am and if I didn't have the beliefs that I had, I would have gone for it did everything. But I didn't want that. So I researched and my friend who's a lawyer, who um, you've also interviewed before, <laughs> <laughs> we all we came together and we came up we put together this 14 I think 17 page divorce decree and it covers everything uh, from it uh, covers so much and so we went back and forth and my um, kids' dad and I went through it line by line and he agreed to everything and we had to take it to the notary at the bank and 
the woman, there's no both of us, and the husband knew both of us, and she, we, we just laughed, and well, she, we, we had to sign it, and like I said, we were in agreement, you know, we had to go through it, and he, she says, I have never seen a divorce decree this, this organized, and then she goes, I also never seen a couple be all get along like you did, because he's been, this is going to be crazy, but he says, you see right here on page this, and mine here, this <laughs> Wait, wait, yes, wait, wait. No. That that part cut out. You said, see this page and, and this part, and then it cut out. And then, it's, and then he said, it says I could still give her hickeys. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad I asked you what that said. <laughs> <laughs> and he, I, I remember it was just a sad, somber day, somber day when we had to do that. But he put, he made, we made just of it because, you know, after 20 plus years of a relationship, you know, we have to get along. We have to, we have these beautiful babies that we have to get along for. And we went through the divorce. And I remember the day, the day it happened. I work with youth. I work with our youth in our tribe. And I had a um, event going on that week of my divorce, which is three days after my birthday. And we did our divorce court. The judge was really upset of what he had to go through because he knew both of us. <clears throat> and we both said our piece, and it was done. And it was just the most surreal experience. And within minutes, I went back to work. And like I said, I work with youth. And I had a facilitator coming from Phoenix who had these kids. He had me sit on a chair. And he had these kids come up behind me and whisper something in my ear. And that was the most amazing experience because all these kids said something like you inspire me you're you're you are loved you're amazing I I'm not I I am what I am because of you and they whispered all these things into my ear so I knew that even though it happened the way it did that it was a blessed experience because um it's been two and a half years and we we have had our moments. Of, I have had my moments where I cannot believe I'm single. I can't believe I have no, I, I'm not married. I, it hurts. It's still very raw. But I rely and trust on my Heavenly Father's will that I needed to be happy. And he meant, and my kids and dad, he still visits us. And he was here. And he said, I had to remember that if she, she needed to be happy. And even if it wasn't with me, she needed to be happy. And she told the missionaries that he told the missionaries that, sorry, he told the missionaries that as long as I was happy, that if it meant that she couldn't be with me, then that's how it has to be. So even though it's a sad story, we're st- we still get along. We still do our best for our kids. And he still supports my kids and me as best as he can. And I don't get through anything without the church, <laughs> without the gospel. So that's something. But yeah, it's been two and a half years. Yeah. Since I got divorced after 22 plus years, we're still working on the temple, to, um, dissolving the temple ordinances. But until then, until I find someone, I have my kids. We have our kids forever. Yeah. Yeah. My husband is a divorce attorney. Like that's what he does day in and day out. And stories like yours are are far, far few. Okay. They they are not very common. And so I think you are blessed by by having that relationship with your ex-husband. And your children yeah. are blessed by having that relationship with their father yeah. and seeing that way, the way you guys treat each other. Yeah, it's more important for them to see us as friends than fighting each other. I mean, if we did enough of that during the marriage, and that's why the marriage ended. We it it wasn't working <laughs> and when you realize that something isn't working you try to do something that will make it work and um sadly this has worked <laughs> this works better <laughs> for us to do it this way yeah. but I I appreciate him so much and he he is a good man he works for my tribe and I appreciate everything he does for us and he's very selfless he's very giving and caring and generous and we're so blessed to have him support us yeah, that's, I'm so glad that you said that. And you also said something that's really important too, that you have have uh, used the gospel to get you through this because it's a huge disappointment and it's a huge change of life, but the gospel is that tool that can help us. Yes, and one thing that I wanted to share is that, you know, I I have always kept, 
too, and I always tried to do my best to stay within the gospel in the church. And I had a really amazing relationship with our state president, who now serves as a mission president in, I believe, Chicago. But he knew my parents, my late parents, and he knew my brother, who served as a bishopric in the bishopric. And one day I saw him, and he told me, you know, Heavenly Father provides a way when the when you're when the priesthood is not there in your home. Hold on. Oh, I, Eileen, can you hear me? Because I can't hear yes. you. All I heard, uh, the oh, last no, thing that I heard was if the priesthood is not in your home, and then it went blank. Oh, I'm holding my phone as still as possible. Oh, <laughs> okay. So, yeah, you said, you said that. <laughs> your uh former stake president um yeah. he, he talked to you okay, about so, so he said that wherever there's an absence that heavenly father will fill that absence and he will make sure and provide a way and so knowing um that there is this major absence in my family dynamic the priesthood holder um the father figure regardless our family has been blessed through the priesthood, through other people, and that absence has been filled in many ways, whether it's through our local missionaries, whether it's people who have held, who are close family that have had the priesthood, to my son holding the priesthood. You know, he said very distinctly that Heavenly Father will make sure that that, that absence will be filled. And I've held on to that so much because I feel the absence, and so I go and do my best to find a way to make sure that we have something. Yeah. So the thought just came to me too, that, um, we, we've been asked by our church leaders to, to exercise our priesthood, even as women. And, and my, um, my birthday was yesterday. We're recording this ahead of time, but my birthday was yesterday. And the day before that, uh, two of the Relief Society sisters came over just to visit with me for my birthday and bring me a Relief Society gift. And as they left, they, uh, um, the one offered a prayer and she, it was, it was an amazing prayer. And she reminded me that even as a daughter of God, I have the rights and, and, uh, privilege to exercise priesthood in my, in my life and in my home. So I think you've probably been doing that as well. Yes, especially through the whole pandemic with the not having church services. Um, we, I, I really, I really appreciate that our missionaries were able to come to our home and we were able to get the sacrament every single week. And as a mom, you know, I rely on prayer. I rely on faith. I rely on calling on my Heavenly Father for strength because on it, I, I do my best to be happy because <laughs> I, I have this thing like 10 second pity party. And I'm like, okay, be done with it and move on. That's awesome. And so I, <laughs> I call it a second pretty funny. But I know that times do get tough. But I also remember the scripture, you know, the um, our, our Heavenly Father Spirit cannot dwell in contention. And what sometimes we fail at that. But, you know, you have to remember that Heavenly Father will dwell as long as we do our best to be happy. And so I do try my best to be positive and look at the brighter side or change change the outlook to try to make it into a more positive situation. Yeah. So um, a few times you've mentioned the word missionary or a mission, like a mission president. And I know that you love um, missionary work. Would you tell us how that has affected your life? So um, I, our family has been blessed from the very beginning of my family with the, with my mom um, from missionaries. My mom was from a small community in our on our reservation called CBQ, and it's one road in, one road out. And as a young little girl, she was visited by missionaries, and my grandpa was willing to let her go, to go to school in Utah and leave our reservation. And so she was a young girl, and she went to school in Utah. She graduated. She was She went to BYU for two years. And she came home two years after and met my dad. <laughs> and then I'm pretty sure missionaries are the ones that got my got a hold of my dad. But um, from the very beginning of my own family, we've been blessed by missionaries. And my life as a little as 
when I was the youngest of my family, there was one missionary who served on our reservation that came back and married an Apache girl and met or gave me my first cradle board. And from there, named all my kids. So all my kids have Polynesian Hawaiian names. From there all the way to me as an adult, um, seeing my parents take care of our missionaries, making sure they have what they need. Um, and then now in my home, I feed the missionaries every every Tuesday. It used to be every Friday, but now it's every Tuesday. So we feed our missionaries and make sure they have what they need. But I love missionaries. And, you know, they take time from their life to serve wherever they are called. And they leave the comforts of home and they do what they can. And for my own kids, you know, I didn't serve a mission. I, I was supposed to. <laughs> I look back and I say that I was supposed to, because in my patriarchal blessing it says I will. I bless you to be able to have the opportunity to, to have, have someone ask you about the church. <laughs> and I've been asked many times, but I love missionaries. I love the spirit that they bring into our homes. And you know, these are just say young men and young women who come to our homes. And fortunately, um, my kids, I instill with them, you know, when you serve a mission, this is going to happen. When you serve a mission, this is how it be. So I've been instilling that in my kids forever. And of course, it is their chance and their opportunity and their choice. Luckily, my oldest daughter accepted and said, and served a mission in the Oklahoma City, Oklahoma mission. She was one of two Native Americans that served in that mission. And she had the most amazing, wonderful experiences. And I have letters from her and pictures and all the experiences that she had. And so I, I'm i always blessed by our missionaries. You know, we've had couples, couple missionaries. We've had sisters that I truly miss. We don't have sister missionaries anymore. But our elders, you know, I they're like my sons. My son is 16, and I have all these missionaries that have been in my home that I've fed and we've taken care of. So I, I know that they are serving an amazing calling to just share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when they're able to share um, and bring people to the gospel, I think that is the most amazing calling. And yeah, I just, I, I, I enjoy our missionaries and I love seeing what they become after, you know, so many missionaries have sent me their wedding invitations or and, and information about babies being born. And it's just, amazing because I, I was able to have them in my home and that's what I love. That's awesome. I love that. <clears throat> um, <laughs> that's so great. You, you <laughs> said that you work with the youth. What, what do you do with them? And, and I've also seen on social media that you have traveled, traveled a lot to different conferences. What, what is your employment? What do you do and how do you, um, what's your end goal with that? My my whole thing, um, this was started as a youth when I was, uh, okay, first let me tell you, I'm a, I am work as a Gonson O'Malley program coordinator. Um, our tribe has a JOM program, which is ha- they've had for many, many years. So I'm a coordinator for that program. So I work with schools and provide fun, uh, supplemental funding for activities and whatnot. But there's a small portion of my budget that I can oversee the Waiman Apache Tribal Youth Council. And to short story, the Waiman Apache Youth Council was established in 1991 with myself and seven other youth. We brought this to our tribe and said, we want to have a youth council and we developed a constitution and we wanted to do all these amazing things. And so now I get to be an advisor to that youth council that I helped create. Um, the reason why I love working with youth is because this set of young people from junior high to high school are in a state of limbo they're like they don't know what they're going to become yet they don't know their future goals yet some do some don't Um, so my whole thing is providing direction providing um, encouragement support so I do that with um, these these conferences that I attend so I've been a part of the United National Indian Tribal Youth Organization otherwise known as UNITY which is based in Phoenix and this conference is over 43 44 years old And I started attending when I was 17. I went to my first conference when I was in Spokane, Washington, and was immersed in this amazing world of Native youth who love to do great things, who want to make positive change for their communities. And so I learned about the Youth Council um, structure at the Unity Conference. And so from there, being a 17, 18-year-old, I brought that home, and I really wanted to do this. So I started... um, 
just working with our community, doing with different things, different um, projects. But one um, area that I really believe helped um, make me grow was being pushed to speak. I believe our voice is so powerful. You know, as a Native youth, we see things at a certain perspective that adults don't see. We see the things that are going on in our own age groups that adults don't see. So I really try to instill in these youth the power of their voice. You know, you have the power to change. You have the power to say what you want our community to look like. And you ha- you are the voice of your, your people. And so that was something that um, I really... I really push for is for these kids to speak up because you'll never know what they want or need or want to see until they speak up about it. So working with the youth council, I've been a part of that for, I've been into my job for about five years. And sadly with the pandemic, we haven't got them off the ground again, but at the most um, busy my youth, youth have been, I've seen kids that will be wallflowers. They'll stand in the back and they won't say much, but um, the facilitating through uh, workshops, through um, goal planning, goal setting, working with them one on one, and just I see these youth come forward, come forward, come forward. And I have one girl who was a wallflower, would not say anything, was so shy, but she came to the meetings, she came to be a part of the conversations. We did um, mapping and goal setting and all these fun things that helped them like look look ahead to what they could uh, what, what they could do for their community. This young girl became the co-president of my youth council, being elected by her peers, and she she's just blossomed in the group. And this is just one story. I mean, there's so many of them that were so shy and so quiet that turned into MCs at the big event. So the Unity Conference is held in a different state every year. And this year, last year was in Dallas, Texas, and this coming year is in, this coming 2022 is in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So imagine 2,000 plus Native youth who want to see positive change for their communities coming together to just work with one another. And so I, that's where I started. I was attending these conferences across the country. I've been all over the country with this unity organization and have, um, I, in my adulthood, I've facilitated workshops. I've talked about positive mindset. I've talked about um, most of the things that I share in the workshops that I do is having a positive mindset, talking about how your thoughts create your environment. You really need to be careful of what you bring into your own life. So really just share my life and with these kids. So that's something that I like. And I really enjoy watching them blossom. I really enjoy watching them become leaders and become um, positive influences and role models. And I see that in my daughter. She's 22 now. She's, I've been taking her to this conference since she was like 10 years old. And I've watched her be at a mistress of ceremonies for the different events. I've watched her speak. I've watched her do all these things. And she's just one of many youth who are able to do that. And that's, that's what I enjoy. That's my most favorite thing to do. I love that. That's super cool. That's awesome. Um, <clears throat> is there, are there any mentors in your life who have, helped you get on that on the path that you're on right now um not just like if with your career but also with the the gospel or or both yeah yeah so i i we touched on this earlier and i hope i don't die <laughs> but one individual who i who knew my parents and was a member of the church and he he i remember when he would talk to my mom and my mom would just be so she just loved him and he he came to our reservation when I was just starting out. I think we were just starting the youth council. We were, I was just figuring out this whole public speaking thing, and um, it was it was it was it was amazing to meet Howard Rayner. Howard Rayner. Um, many of us that work in Unity have our own Howard Rayner story. And for me, Howard Rayner came to my reservation, and like I said, we were having a bout of suicides on the reservation. This was in the nineties and he came to do a community day of prayer and he talked to the parents um, at an event and he was asked to go into the schools. And like I said, I was like 18 years old. And I think I, I don't remember if I'd gone to unity yet. I know I was 17, 18. 
<clears throat> but he he talked to my mom and I was just quiet sitting beside my mom and he looked at me and he goes what are you doing tomorrow I said uh nothing he goes can you come with me tomorrow and go to these schools I said yeah and my mom thought that was the most amazing thing so I wore my cap dress and I went with him and he took me to these schools our schools on our reservation and he would talk and he was just thunder you know the way he spoke it was just like I can rule the world if I just listen to him every single day <laughs> it was just amazing to watch him work but one thing that he did, he saw, he finished his little thing and he was like, but you know, you, I, I love talking with you, but you need to hear from one of your own. And he was, I like to call a filing crocker to come up and speak. And I was like, what? <laughs> you want me to talk? You're like, is and there just, somebody else here with that same name? <laughs> <laughs> I, I always remember that. And I was like slowly getting up there and I walked and, you know, the power of our own voice, the power of your own thoughts, the power of who, what you can say. You know, I I think I fell in love with it when he did that to me because we did that at like four schools. And every time, every after, he was like, that was really good. You got to, uh, this would be awesome if you do it like this. If you want to say it like this, he truly like molded the way I spoke and the way I could share like my thoughts. And I don't know what I said. Just like when you give your testimony at church or you have to give a talk, you don't remember what you said. <laughs> You just go by what you're inspired to say. And he he really did that for me. And I'll always remember that. And he was a wonderful, amazing man. And the last time I got to see him was a, just a few years ago before Makana went on her mission. He um, did a little training at Unity in, oh, I don't even remember where, but I was able to talk with him and he was still the same. And so he's one that I truly appreciate um, what he did for me. And other mentors and people that have helped me is my, my dear sister, um, the missionary that came and gave me my creative work when I was a baby. He had a daughter two years younger than me. We played in the mud together. We played in the rain together. Um, Ke Aloha Duma. She, she is an amazing woman that I just truly look up to. Her and her family have loved us so much. And I appreciate our conversations. You know, when my, when we, I, my family lived in Georgia, my kids' dad served in the army and we lived in Georgia for four years and he served in Iraq twice. And so I really appreciate it being able to call her and talk to her about church and the lessons on Sunday and knowing that we were, we, we had the same lesson that, that Sunday and we kept in touch through all our years. And um, she she has been an amazing person to help me within the gospel and out with our jobs and whatnot to just be the best Latter-day Saint that we could be. And um, I went to Unity one year with her and I remember riding the plane and we sat on the plane together and she was like, let's read the scriptures. And she pulled out her scriptures and she just opened it. And it was in French because she sent a message, a mission in France. <laughs> Help me. <laughs> it's those little experiences like that that I'm truly grateful for. But yeah, I've, I those those two are the top two that came to my head, and I just there's many, but those are the two that helped me so much. Yeah, and of course, the, of course, the example of my parents. You know, I have rock star parents. My dad served in the state presidency. My mom was an amazing, amazing woman, and the examples that they left for me, I those have helped me as well. Yeah. So you said you have five minute pity parties, but if if there are times when you just can't pull out of that five minute pity party, what do you do when ten you're dead? Oh, t- ten sec. Sorry, say yeah, I yeah. said it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> when you're down, what do you do to feel better? How do you pull yourself out of it? Uh, the ten second pity parties. I, I, I. I love to sing. I try to sing in my head or sing out loud if I have to. I read scriptures or I listen to something that's uplifting. Um, But the main thing I remember is that Heavenly Father's spirit cannot dwell in contention. And so I really pull myself out of it just because I don't want the spirit to leave me. And I know the moment that I start to feel pity or feel sad or whatever, I need to remember what I have. And the best thing that I know that I have is my kids. I see their faces. I hear their laughter. I see my baby girl. Um, I remember the blessings that I have already. 
and I remember that, you know, Heavenly Father can bless me with so much more. You know, being able to find peace within going to the temple. I love going to the temple. It's been um, on January 2nd. I went to get my first endowment in 2015. And I love going to the temple and just being able to feel the peace that only Heavenly Father can bring. You know, we we there's many things we can do on our own, but we need to rely on the spirit of our Heavenly Father, our the example of our savior to just do to get that extra help. So I, this year, my goal is to go to the temple as many times as possible. I've already scheduled two temple trips. You have to schedule now. So you have to plan ahead. You can't just show up at the temple anymore like we used to. So I have two temple sessions ready for the month of January. So my peace and my, my grounding happens in the temple. That's awesome. How how far away is the temple from where you live? It's about an hour, well, less than an hour. I say it's an hour so that I can leave an hour ahead. Yeah. <laughs> but it's less than an hour, and I like I have a I'll have a nine thirty appointment. I have to leave at least by eight to get their time change and whatnot. So yeah, it's about an hour and a half drive. Our hour drive, but leave an hour and a half. So I'm very grateful for our Snowflake Temple that I'm able to go to. And I've since um I got since I was I've been able to go to the temple, all my traveling, you know, all these years I've traveled from when I was eighteen, you know, going across the country, Florida, Oregon, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, all these places I've been to, you know, I kicked myself over and over for not getting my endowment long before. You know, I waited. I waited saying, I will go to the temple when I get married, I'll go when I get sealed to when, five years passed, 10 years passed, 15 years passed. <laughs> and I was not going because I was waiting for something that I thought was never going to happen. And so 2015, I was like, you know, I'm going to go. I need to go. And so I, to this day, I do kick myself that for all these years, I've been worthy to go. I've been able to go. I didn't because I was waiting for something. I was waiting for someone. And so when I, as soon as I got, had the opportunity and got my endowment, every trip I've, tri- every trip I've gone to, since then, I've gone to the temple. I've been to the Hartford, Connecticut temple. I've been to the San Diego temple, the Los Angeles temple. I've been to Oklahoma City temple. So all the tra- all my traveling now has my job purpose as well as a spiritual purpose to go to the visit the temple. So I'm looking forward to going to Minneapolis. And I should have a trip to D.C. soon, very soon. So I hope to go to the D.C. temple. So, yeah, it's 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 right there. I'm like we need to take advantage. We need to take advantage of that piece to go. So I, I really stress to family and members of the church to get your endowments and go. Thank you. Yeah. I, I just love the gospel so much. I love being, having a foundation and I love that we have an open, open communication to our father in heaven. That's one thing that has blessed my life in so many ways. I know sometimes Sometimes I pray as I'm praying. I'm like, I'm so thankful that you have given us prayer. Thank you for prayer. So I have one last question for you. What does it mean to you to know that you belong to the tribe of Israel? So it, like I said, with the church, we have a beautiful foundation. We have um, gospel principles. We have a direction. We have... um, this way of life and way to live to help us be happy and knowing that we come from the tribe of Israel is just that icing on the cake. You know, we have a foundation, we have our leaders, we have our ancestry and knowing that we come from this beautiful line is comforting that we were sent to this earth, um, to obtain a body, to live life, and to return back to our Heavenly Father. But for us, the unique part of it is that we are part of the tribe of Israel. And it has always been something that I didn't understand until I became an adult. And as my kids gave, my my kids received their own patriarchal blessings. And I am just, it's just a blessing to know that we have this direction we have a direction from our past and we have a direction forward 
And we also have knowledge knowing that who we are and the blessings that we have are going to help in the last days that we have a purpose and that we have a direction to live our life. So I'm always grateful for that knowledge because we, we are amazing. We are so special. And our Lamanite people, if we only knew, if everyone only knew how amazing we are and how our lineage goes so much further, I think that is a blessing in itself. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. I've enjoyed this time so much, and I'm thankful for your testimony. So Eileen mentioned that she takes care of the missionaries as often as she can, at least every Tuesday night. And the funny thing is, like, two days later, after I interviewed her, I was um, scrolling scrolling through Facebook, and I saw Eileen had a post about having the missionaries over, and they had done vision boards. And then... um, my one of my best friends had made a comment on Eileen's um, post, and I was like, "Wait a second, because my best friend is from Idaho, and so I emailed my friend or texted my friend. Her name is Malia. I'm like, Malia, you didn't tell me, and she's like, "What? I didn't know. <laughs> it was kind of super funny, but uh, my friend Malia is." a mother to a missionary who was just hanging out with Eileen. And I was like, this totally testifies of the fact that Eileen truly does take care of the missionaries. She's like, Eileen, I'm texting back and forth. Eileen's like, well, I, there was a, there's a new guy from Idaho. His name is, and she's like, she's like, is this the one? I'm like, yes. So it was super funny to me. I really got a kick out of it. Um, but I love that. I love that she does take care of the missionaries. I love how Eileen shows her children how to care for the missionaries. And um, I'm grateful for that. I So this week we've been talking about Adam and Eve a lot. And it's uh, I'm recording this on Sunday night. And we just finished all of our Adam and Eve lessons, uh, reading and everything. And I've, I've been listening to another podcast. It's not a religion based podcast, but this guy that I'm listening to, he really is always encouraging people to read the Bible and to know all the good values that you can glean from the Bible. And I love that about this guy. But I also recognize how much we are blessed as members of the church to have the Bible, both the Old and the New Testament, and the Book of Mormon, and the Doctrine and Covenants, and the Pearl of Great Price, and Modern Revelation. Uh, This week, I've been so grateful for all of those things that have helped me know our first parents better and I feel like that about and I I, I guess I feel like that about a lot of the doctrines that we have because um, because we have this wholer more complete version of of events and the reasons why and I, I just I'm really grateful for that this week I've always loved the Book of Mormon but I've loved this week in particular where we've we've had use of all of the all of the scriptures at the same time. I thought that was really cool. So I'm really grateful for that and I hope that you have found that through your study with the come follow me and um yeah. So I hope you have a super wonderful awesome day. Here are the rules that I've decided. So the contest begins as soon as you hear this episode or read it on social media. So let's say January 4th, 2022. 
and the contest winners will be announced on the episode airing January 25th, 2022. I will randomly pick a name from entries that are received like this. Uh, Each of my former guests will get one entry. Uh, Each new referral will get one entry, but these referrals need to be prepped by you before I call or email them or text them. So don't just give me a name and be like, oh, you should contact them. If you know them, I would like you to please contact them ahead of time and let them know that I would like to talk to them or send us a group email or something, but prep them ahead of time so it's not a cold call by me. So each new, uh, each referral is one entry. A formal tag of Tribe of Testimonies on Facebook or Instagram. And to me, that means a formal tag means with what you liked about the episode or the podcast in general. Tag Tribe of Testimonies and that will get you one entry per week. So you could have three entries possible that way. Um, And if you would like to be a guest, you reach out to me. And we schedule it, not just you would like to be a guest, but let's schedule it. A scheduled guest yourself is one entry. So just remember that this podcast is conversations with faithful Native American members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I do recognize we have brothers and sisters in other places, but my focus is with members of tribes of the United States and with Canada. And I would love to have other tribes represented. I we've I should count how many different tribes we have represented represented so far this 2021. Um, but I'd love to have more tribes represented. And a question you might have is can non-natives enter to win? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Please help me share these testimonies and help me find guests. So share on social media and help me find referrals. Um, so yes, and I, again, want to thank Kyle and his father, his, uh, father started on the flute and Kyle finished it for making and providing the flute. I hope that makes you excited that we get a giveaway. And like I said, there's also two pens. So two people will be able to win a pen and one person, the flute. Tribe of Testimonies is not affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The music is a traditional hymn, Come Thou Found of Every Blessing, arranged and performed by Kyle Forsyth. If you know someone who might be interested in being a guest, please reach out to me at tribeoftestimonies at gmail.com.